Welcome to the fourth installment of Black Cat Theology. My name is Peter Dillard, and we are continuing our investigation of possible relations between the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger and contemporary theology. Today marks a major turning point in our lecture series because so far the discussion has been rather abstract. Today I want to turn to more concrete, experiential, and phenomenological considerations and I want to begin to investigate how they might have a bearing upon distinctively theological concerns and inquiry. Now last time we saw that three possible proto-theologies could be extracted from Heidegger's later writings. According to the first proto-theology, the holy, or God, is not the same as the non-metaphysical event of being, or Reignis in German. Rather, the holy is a particular being, a divine being. The second proto-theology maintains that God or the Holy is not any particular being, but in fact is the same as the non-metaphysical event of being. And the third proto-theology holds that the, the Holy or God is neither a particular being nor the non-metaphysical event of being itself, but rather is a non-being that is also not something fictitious like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, but is, in, is a matter of ultimate concern. Now, the problem with the first proto-theology we saw is that Heidegger doesn't explain what it is about the, this being that makes it divine as opposed to all the other non-divine beings. He doesn't explain the divinity, non-divinity distinction at all. The second proto-theology faces two problems we saw. First, it either threatens to make all beings equally holy, equally divine, and that would entail an untenable polytheism, or it threatens to make no being divine, but all beings equally ordinary and non-divine, and so it threatens to eliminate divinity altogether. An additional, an additional problem with this second proto-theology is that it overlooks Heidegger's insistence also in his later writings that the non-metaphysical event of being is a measure not only for beings, but also for the holy. And so since a measure is not the same thing as what it measures, that implies that the non-metaphysical event of being is not the same as the holy, since that's something it measures, contrary to the second proto-theology. Now, the third proto-theology avoids all those problems, but it still faces a formidable hurdle, because it still seems like nothing more than a bare position in logical space. It seems like a philosophical position, a purely intellectual position, that doesn't have any real connection with human experience. It seems very abstruse and attenuated. Indeed, it seems no less abstruse and attenuated than Heidegger thinks the traditional notion of God, the traditional metaphysical notion of God as causa sui is, just as it's very hard to see how we could dance or kneel before the first cause, which is this metaphysical abstraction, uh, it's also hard to see how we could deal or worship or bow before the, this, the, the notion of the holy as something that's neither a being nor non-metaphysical being. It's, it's, it's very unclear. And so there's no phenomenological or experiential content here. Now, what I want to do in the lecture today is three things. First, I want to set forth this narrative that Heidegger presents in his later writings concerning the non-metaphysical event of being, the holy, and the last God. The second thing I want to do is explain or pre present a plausible interpretation of what Heidegger might have in mind when he says that the holy needs the non-metaphysical event as a measure. And thirdly, I want to investigate or bring out the phenomenological considerations in, considerations in Heidegger's later writings that might be injected, if you will, into this very abstruse third proto-theology to give it more experiential content. And surprisingly, we are going to see that there are two, at least two possible ways of beginning to develop, if you will, a phenomenological theology based on Heidegger's later writings. Now let's begin with the first task. What is this narrative that Heidegger sets forth about non-metaphysical being the holy and the last God? We find it, for example, in Contributions of Philosophy. And the basic idea is that first there needs to be an advent of non-metaphysical being, this event where we stop thinking about being metaphysically as some maximally general characteristic common to all and only beings, and we start to think about 
being and the world in this radically non-metaphysical way. Once that happens, then it becomes possible for there to be a second advent. And in the second advent, that's the possibility of the holy manifesting itself to us, of the last God passing us by, as Heidegger says, in this very evocative way, poetic way. So that second event, advent of the holy, it's not guaranteed that that's going to happen. But it can only happen, it's only possible, Heidegger thinks, if the first advent, that is the non-metaphysical event of being, happens. So already we see that the narrative fits better with the third proto-theology because the advent of non-metaphysical being is something different from the possible advent of the holy. And so non-metaphysical being and the holy seem to be different things, just as the third proto-theology says. Now, let's go back to the advent of non-metaphysical being. Heidegger sometimes makes it sound like this is a monolithic occurrence, like it will happen at some point, it may happen in the history of Western society and Western civilization, that all at once we stop thinking about being metaphysically and we start thinking about it in this radically non-metaphysical way. And so very briefly, and I discuss this at more length in my book, what he seems to have in mind here is that what will help us to overcome metaphysics is to see that all these metaphysical conceptions, these, these universalizing concepts, arise within a certain historical theater of time. That, for example, a certain way of thinking about being, say, is in terms of Platonic forms or Aristotel Aristotelian actuality, or maybe with Kant we think of being as to, to be is to be a potential object of representational judgment. Or with Hegel we think that, well, to be is to be uh, in, enfolded with an absolute spirit, to, uh, to be part of that development of absolute spirit. Those universal concepts come to us in this historical time, this historical theater. And Heidegger seems to think, especially in contributions to philosophy, that once we see that temporal character of those conceptions, how they rise and fall, then we see that they no longer have any kind of bedrock purchase on the nature of reality, if you will. They're simply historical constructions or historical phenomena. That's all they are. Now, briefly, I think a problem with this is that Heidegger threatens not, not just to, over, not to overcome metaphysics, but he actually, when he starts talking about the, this notion of temporality, he threatens to reinstate metaphysics. Because now it sounds like what being is, being is the following maximum general characteristic. Anything that is comes to us through historical time and manifests itself to us through historical time. That's what it is to be. So that's a maximum general characteristic common to all and only beings. They're temporal, historically temporal in this way, and that's no less metaphysical by Heidegger's lights than the other metaphysical conceptions we've been discussing. Now there's another way though to think about the advent of the non-metaphysical event of being, and that's not to think of it as some kind of monolithic happening which we can't really control or engineer, but that might we might be involved in it might happen like the way Woodstock happened, okay, to use an example that Hubert Dreyfus gives. It's not going to be some kind of monolithic happening. It might rather unfold in a piecemeal manner. It might be that on some occasions we find that a, a way of, there's a certain way of thinking metaphysically that is interfering with our understanding of divinity, that is obscuring it or skewing it or distorting it, and that a, a sort of more localized non-event, non-metaphysical event of being would be that, well, whatever those concepts are, those metaphysical notions or possibly other philosophical concepts, whatever they are that, that are that are leading us to have problems in thinking about God, we find some other way of thinking that avoids those problems. We become extricated from the metaphysical confusions or possibly other philosophical confusions that are engendered by those concepts. Let me give a very specific example. Someone might be in a metaphysical vein asking herself, well, how is it possible for there to be a plurality of distinct things in one and the same world? How is genuine unity and diversity possible? And someone might say, metaphysically, well, how that goes is this way. There are, in addition to all the things, a multitude of relations binding these things together into a single world. Now, the problem with that, as F. H. Bradley said decades ago, and this is the argument that, of his that I'm summarizing, frankly, the problem with that is that 
If you want to explain how things cohere into a single world, you're not going to get anywhere by positing additional things like relations, as like super things or uber objects. Because if we already don't understand how things cohere into a single world while remaining distinct, then adding more things in the form of relations is not going to do any good. And furthermore, if we're not careful, that could really hamper our understanding of God. Because if somebody wants to think about God traditionally as something that's radically distinct from the world, the problem now is that since we can no longer explain how a plurality of things cohere together in a single world, it looks like they all fuse into one big monistic mass, which is exactly the conclusion that Bradley drew in Appearance and Reality. So if there is a God, either he has to be part of that, in which he's not radically distinct from the universe anymore, or maybe there isn't any God at all. So the metaphysics is getting in, way, in the way of thinking about God here. That's an example of that. Now, what might a localized non-metaphysical event of being be here that frees us from that confusion? Well, Heidegger discusses in his commentary on the poetry of Georg Trakl, he discusses poems in which Heidegger, in which Trakl, excuse me, focuses on this figure of the threshold. Well, what he means by that is literally the threshold in a, a dwelling where people live and they cross the threshold entering or exiting the, 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 the house or the hut or the the, the dwelling, in the course of pursuing various activities. They may cross the threshold on their way out to check the weather or to get water from the well. They may cross it on their way in. A husband and wife who've just been married in the church may cross the threshold together to begin their married life together in the home. Or at the end of one's life, the person may cross the threshold on the way uh, of being carried out. When the person has died and we carry him or her out to the churchyard to be buried, uh, that person, that the dead person crosses the threshold. So the threshold is like a focal point in which a multitude of different beings come together and sort of focuses our attention on that. But notice, the threshold is nothing in particular. It's nothing but an empty space. It's not an object. It's not a relation. It's not any kind of metaphysical entity. It's a nothingness. It's just a space. And so what Heidegger might be suggesting here is that in order to understand unity and diversity in diversity in a non-metaphysical way, maybe we should reflect on the threshold and our involvement with it. As we sort of, without making any particular metaphysical or philosophical judgments, we simply cross it in, uh, in the course of engaging with various act beings in a plurality of activities. And that's how we understand unity and diversity. You want to understand unity and diversity? Don't postulate some kind of set of relations as special things, but simply reflect on your mastery of the practice of crossing this threshold in the pursuit of various activities that involve many different kinds of beings. And once we do that, then it's not like there's a threat that everything is going to collapse into this metaphys metaphysical uh, mora or monism so that if there's a God, he either has to be part of that, in which case he's not distinct from the universe, or there isn't a God at all. The metaphysical confusion, once the metaphysical confusion is removed, then our thinking about divinity in this particular instance is no longer obscured. So that's a sense in which the non-metaphysical event of being is needed by the holy. It's needed so that we, the holy needs the non-metaphysical event of being piecemeal to help us avoid metaphysical and possibly other philosophical confusions that obscure or cloud our thinking about divinity. That doesn't mean that the holy itself is not radically transcendent or that it's somehow essentially dependent upon something else beside it, but, it, but we need non-metaphysical being, this piecemeal enlightenment, if you will, in order to think more clearly about divinity. Now, lastly for today, what are the two different kinds of phenomenological considerations that we find, and there are two, in later Heidegger's writings that might have some bearing on theology? One set of considerations is focused around the notion of struggle or strife, in German, strife, between world and earth. So this is a struggle between disclosure, what's open, disclosed, open to view on the one hand, and what's hidden or concealed. Heidegger gives an example in The Origin of the Work of Art when he's thinking about a Greek temple, not in a museum 
or in a, in a later installation, but in its original setting where in ancient Greece, where this temple serves as a focal point that focuses a struggle between world and earth in the lives of the ancient Greek people. The world consists of various ways of possible ways of being in the ancient Greek world that the temple focuses, like being a hero, or being an oracle, or being a, a, a priest, an ancient Greek priest. Those are ways of being. Those are That's disclosed as a possible way of being in that world. But it's not figured out. In other words, those roles may be set forth as possible ways of openness, but each person who is a member of that society has to struggle to figure out how to be a warrior, or how to be an oracular presence, or how to be a priest, or how to be a slave, or any of those other things. And that's a struggle with what is difficult and deep and hidden. And it goes on throughout the existence of that historical people. So that's the struggle between world and earth. Now there's another, though, set of phenomenological descriptions that Heidegger gives in his later writings that circles on the notion of Gelassenheit, which in German means letting be. Here, Heidegger often talks not about the struggle between world and earth, rather he talks about a sort of peaceful, serene, and yet energized dwelling among the fourfold of earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. So here the emphasis is, is on Galassenheit, it's on a more, it's a kind of serenity. And these are real human experiences. We understand those experiences, we understand what it is to struggle with being a certain role, or with a certain problem, or a certain question. We understand what it is to dwell peacefully, at least at times in our very hectic lives, we have an appreciation of what this kind of peaceful serenity is that we crave, right? And so these are definite human experiences. Now, this suggests, if we, if we look at this carefully, we can see that there are at least two ways, then, of, eject, of injecting more substantive content into that third proto-theology. And it depends. It's a, it's a pair of permutations. We have the struggle between world and earth, that's one kind of experience, and the, the experience of energized tranquility or glass and height. Now, depending on how we assign those experiences to different parts of the narrative, we wind up with different theologies. For example, if we assigned the phenomena, if we assign the phenomenology of struggling the struggle between world and earth, with the non-metaphysical event of being, then that means that this piecemeal struggle to, to extricate ourselves from metaphysical confusion, that is a struggle. And what our experience of it is, is confronting something, trying to wrest clarity from what's obscure. In this case, trying to wrest non-metaphysical clarity from metaphysical obscurity. But then the experience of glass and height of serene dwelling, that energized dwelling, that would pertain to our experience of the holy, the div of divinity, right? And so that means that we have what might be called a Galassenheit theology. The struggle between world and earth pertains to the advent of non-metaphysical being, where we extricate ourselves from certain confusions, and the experience of Galassenheit, that's our fundamental ex experience of divinity once we're freed from that. But Correlatively, it could go the other way. We might assign the experience of, of glass and height to the non-metaphysical event of being, where here the process of extricating ourselves from metaphysical and other kinds of philosophical confusion, this kind of piecemeal extrication, that really is a sort of relaxed, calm, but energized activity that we associate with glass and height. But the real struggle then, once that happens, the struggle then is that we encounter God as something hidden, something that is concealed, with which we must struggle in order to wrest some measure of clarity. God is like a paradox, maybe even a contradiction, but we have to struggle with that in order to uh, uh, attain some kind of relationship with it. So in the second possible phenomenological theology, the struggle between world and earth pertains to the non-metaphysical event of being, and the, ex the I'm sorry, I got that backwards. The, the experience of glass and height, the experience of peaceful dwelling among the fourfold, that pertains to achieving freedom from metaphysical confusion, and the experience of struggle, of trying to rest, uh, the experience of trying to wrest clarity from obscurity, that pertains 
to our experience of God. And so here we have a strite theology. In the Galassian high theology, strite has to do with overcoming metaphysics, and Galassianite has to do with our experience of God. That's the Galassianite theology. In the strite theology, it's the other way around. The experience of Galassianite pertains to extricating ourselves from metaphysical and other forms of philosophical confusion, right? And the experience of struggle, of trying to wrest clarity from obscurity, that pertains to our experience of divinity. So we can have either a strite theology or a Galassianite theology. That's not really a theology yet, but it's the beginning of something, because both of those take the third proto-theology, according to which the holy is neither the non-metaphysical event of being itself, nor any particular being, but is a certain kind of non-being, the last God, who needs the non-metaphysical event of being as a measure to free us from metaphysical confusion so that we can encounter the last God as much as possible free of that, and then, depending on how we assign the phenomenology, it can either be that it's our freeing ourselves from confusion, that has to do with a struggle, and, and that frees us up for a peaceful, serene, and energized experience of God. That's Galas and Height theology. Or it's the experience of Galas and Height, this serene and energized calmness. That's what we get when we extricate ourselves from metaphysical confusion. And that sets us up then, or prepares us for the experience of God as the experience of trying to wrest clarity from obscurity because God is like an enigma. Now that's all for today. I'm sorry that the lecture went a little long, but I wanted to cover that ground because it's essential for what we're going to do next. We are next time hopefully going to look at some of the strengths and advantages of each of these possible theologies, both Glass and Height theology and Strite theology, in order to make a provisional decision about which one of them we might want to develop in this lecture series. And I also want to say something about the connection between theology proper and faith. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for your patience. And I hope you found these lectures interesting. I look forward to talking with you some more next time. Take care. Bye-bye.